So now we will switch to another subject, the Nixon reactions. So here's an outline of my talk. I will give a short introduction of on NXN reactions. Then very, very short, on, uh, uh, not so short, but uh, I will give the application where, why this kind of reaction have to be studied. Okay, the facility, I will be short because now you know everything about that. And uh, I will give three kinds of experimentary manner to measure this NXN reactions. Uh, very shortly, give a very few words about double differential measurements, and I will finish by giving uh, some examples of measurement where wh what can be used to this kind of uh, of uh, uh, reaction. So, what is an Nixon reaction? So, you send a neutron on a nuclei. Is it you produce X neutrons and you produce these daughter nuclei? So, X can be one, two, or, or more. So. It's an evidence, but you produce an isotope. It means that you can't separate chemically, except if these daughter nuclei decay by beta, for example, in another, uh, in other spaces. That's threshold reaction. Uh, okay, I, I won't speak about elastic, uh, elastic reaction. Okay, uh, what we call NN prime, it's when uh, X equal one, and in fact, the neutrons give one part of its, of its energy to the nuclei. Uh, and excited the, the nuclei. So the Q value will depend on the first excited level of the nuclei. So now you can calculate the Q value on the energy threshold just by uh, knowing the uh, mass excess of the different uh, of the nuclei. So just to, to, to show, here I just put the energy threshold of uh, reaction on silicon, iron, and lead as a function of the X. Okay. And you can see that uh, the heavier the nuclei is, the lower the threshold of uh, reaction is. And this threshold, of course, increases with the energy, uh, with the uh, X. Uh, N to N reaction have a threshold higher than an N to N uh, and so. So just an illustration on the lead, you see a uh, threshold on N to N reaction, it's uh, around 7 MeV, N to N around 14 MeV, and N for N around 22 MeV. So what happens when you make a reaction? So you had uh, an overview uh, two days ago by Jan, when a neutron uh, interacts uh, with a neutron, it uh, produces uh, composed nuclei, which can decay in different, uh, in different uh, channels. But before the equilibrium is reached, before the creation of the composed nuclei, you have a pre phases during which particles, neutrons, but also protons, can be emitted. Okay? And for a reaction, you have the direct component, you have the repulsion process, and the pre process. And you can uh, uh, connect this kind of component to this kind of spectrum. It's an energy spectrum. The direct, the direct reaction are at the high energy part. Evaporation part are at the low energy part, <laughs> statistically evaporation. And between, you have the pre process. So you can, if you reproduce, you want to reproduce uh, okay, I didn't mention, it's also uh, related to the time of reaction. So these reactions are the fastest, and the evaporation are the, the shortest. But when we say uh, short, uh, it's still very short uh, time of reaction compared to the time of, uh, of humans during your, your reaction, during the experiment. So, and here you have a, a spectrum of a neutron emitted in a reaction with a 14 MeV uh, neutrons. So you can see you have the elastic contribution, the contribution due to evaporation, and here the contribution to the uh, uh, pre -curium. So you have to take into account all this process if you want to reproduce uh, your kind of uh, things. Here you have the pre process is taking into account here and the uh, evaporation here. So, <coughs> and this reaction are, um, of course, important in the energy range between, uh, let's say, one MeV and few tenths of MeV. Here you have the different cross-section and reaction on, on bismuth. Uh, the black one is a total reaction, uh, cross-section reaction, and you have here the inelastic cross-section in red, the N to N and the N to N. And you can see that in the energy range, okay, this uh, cross-section is quite important. It's an important contribution to the total reaction. So if now you switch to a facile nuclei and you're in eight, in addition to the previous uh, spectrum, you had to add the, the fission contribution. But again, these uh, reactions are quite uh, important and you have to take into account, of course. 
So here it's to illustrate the importance of uh, okay of again this uh, this reaction compared to the reaction uh, cross section, and here it's to illustrate. I spoke about the pre equilibrium and you need to take into account uh, neutrons emitted during the pre equilibrium phases. If not, you are not able to reproduce your cross section. Here you have cross section measure on niobium uh, 83 and 2n and 3n uh, and n prime as a function of the energy and different uh, calculation perform okay it was uh, performed by a code close to talis not exactly talis it's gnash but you see that if you don't take into account the pre emission you can't reproduce the, the right uh, cross section so now uh, what uh, where this kind of reaction take uh, take a role so we can mention the reactor and also the accelerator-driven system. You have a large amount of neutrons, and when you produce an NXN reaction, it contributes to the ener energy loss of the neutrons. The neutron will lose energy. You will, in some cases, multiply your number of neutrons. If uh, you have an N to N, you start with N neutrons, and you have two neutrons. So, and you produce a daughter, nuclei, which can be radioactive. So, all these features have to be taken into account, of course. Uh, for the balance of neutrons in your in your core or in your uh, accelerator driven system, and also for the production of uh, of radioisotope, it's the same in the fusion technology where a large part of neutron is a 14 <coughs> mV neutron. So you will produce this kind of reaction, NXN, and you will produce, for example, waste, uh, undesirable uh, nuclei in your uh, in your set in your facility. Now, when you make uh, nuclear data evaluation. You need to know all the channels because you need to make something consistent. So, and if you don't know the N in XN cross section, you can't perform uh, reliable uh, evaluations. And another point I will show an example just after. Uh, you can use, you can need this kind of reaction in order to characterize a neutron field. You have a neutron field, you want to measure its flux on its energy distribution, you can do it by using kind, this kind of uh, reaction. So it means uh, also that for reliable uh, evaluated databases, you need accurate measurements. So how can we characterize a neutron field? Uh, okay. In fact, you can use this kind of reaction to determine the differential flux from a different source. It could be an accelerator, it could be a reactor. So you radiate a sample from a type E with a flux phi. That's the flux you want to determine. Okay. You measure the activity of each one of your samples. The activity is related to the, the flux you want to measure, the cross section of the reaction you are, uh, you, you are using, and it's proportional to these parts. Now, you will simulate a flux, xi, the one you suppose to be representative of the flux you want to measure, and you can calculate the same activity, but this one is simulated. And now, by comparing this simulated and this measurement, okay, you try to minimize the difference by adjusting this C flux, and by this way, you can determine, by iterative method, you can determine the flux C representative to the, the one you want to measure. But to do that, you will need to have a several set of cross section, okay, with several sets of samples. And you have to choose this cross section, this reaction, sorry, in order to cover the energy balance of interest of your flux. Okay? So it will depend on the energy threshold of your cross section. And you have also to find some reaction where you can produce a measurement, a product you can measure by a, a uh, you can measure, it means it should be radioactive, you should be, uh, have a period measurable uh, and uh, with, a, uh, with a, a, a decay you can measure, okay? okay? And which kind of reaction you can use? You can reaction NP, N alpha, or N N prime or N XN. So here is an example on, of, of flow. Of course, if you want to be able to determine your flu, flux phi, you need to have a, a good knowledge of your cross section. Here is an example of reaction you can use uh, up to 20 MeV. So here you have the cross section of different reactions. So it's not only an XN reaction, and there are also N alpha, NP, but you have an N prime and two N reactions. So and you see that uh, if you have a flux up to 20 MeV, uh, with this indium you will cover the first 
part, this low energy, low energy part of the flux, and with this reaction, for example, the end to end, you will be sensitive only to the high energy part of your flux. That's one of the uh, applications of that. So now if you go at higher energy than uh, 20 MeV, uh, here I, I put an example of neutron spectrum uh, produced in a, in a heavy ion reaction at high energy and 100 MeV per nucleon. So uh, uh, the energy spectra was measured by using some samples and by using uh, different type of sample and different uh, neutron uh, induced reaction here. And you see, in order to, to go higher in energy, if you use different reaction on bismuth, it's N3N, N4N, N5N, N6N. And 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 so you see that here you have the threshold energy of this, each of these reactions. So, and with this reaction, you can determine the flux at the high energy part. Okay. And uh, okay, here you have all the parameters you need. Uh, for example, the half-life, which must be measurable, and also the energy of the gamma ray. So here you have an example of uh, the result which were obtained with this kind of, uh, of measurement. Uh, the, the solid line are the flux they have deduced from them uh, for them irradiation. So it was measured for this uh, different uh, different reaction. So for example, in the case there are probably no other solution to do that because if you want measure to, to measure this kind of measurement of, of spectrum uh, by time of light technique, for example, as you have neutron up to 100 MeV, you need a quite long fly path and you need adapted uh, frequency and it's probably it's sometimes not, not uh, available at the, at the facilities. Okay, and you can also deduce uh, the angular distribution if you place your uh, samples at different angles. So now I will go to the facility uh, which you use to take this kind of, uh, of, uh, of measurements. Uh, so I will go very fast uh, because on that part you, you know almost everything. We can produce neutrons in accelerator, in photofission, or with nuclear fission in, in reactors. Uh, what are the important parameters? The energy range, of course. Uh, I say you, okay, I put 5 MeV, but for NN prime, it's less than, one, uh, than 5 MeV. So the genre of interest will be this, this energy range. The energy, energy distribution will be very important because depending on your energy distribution, you will adapt your measurement techniques. It can be monokinetic or it can be continuous spectrum. The fluence, of course, because it's important in order to determine your uh, counting rate. And the time structure. Uh, do you have a pulse beam or not? And we will distinguish two types of facilities, the open field or the collimated beam. So a reactor, you know, we produce neutrons by fission. And uh, just, okay, in this, that case, we will uh, use uh, not, uh, not water reactor, not uh, PWR reactor, where neutrons are <laughs> are slowed down, but the reactor where you have uh, only uh, pure uh, fission neutrons. Huh? This, here you have a picture of uh, such a kind of, uh, of, uh, of reactor. And what is interesting that if you see at, you look at the, the neutron spectrum of, uh, of the neutron produced in the reactor, it's a pure fission uh, neutron spectrum. So you can see that the cover, for example, the NN prime uh, energy range, uh, the energy range of the NN prime reaction of, uh, of uranium 5, and also you cover uh, the opening of the end to end channel. So it means that this kind of flux can be used for also for end to end reactions. <coughs> so you can use Brehm Strahlung facilities. Uh, okay, I don't go much in the detail, you know or, uh, what is it now. Uh, we'll have a look uh, later on, different facilities. Uh, here it's NLB and Angelina. You heard about, uh, about that. Uh, for higher energy, we can use uh, quasi monolithic spectrum. In that case, uh, use mostly proton beam, uh, eating a lithium converter, and you can produce neutron spectrum, which is quasi monocentric, uh, a component which is uh, equal to the proton energy minus uh, 2 MeV and a, a long tail at low, at low energy. Okay, so, uh, and you can also have a continuous spectrum. In that case, you use a SIG converter or not a SIN converter, and you produce a continuous spectrum uh, as a, this, a, this kind of, uh, of shape. Okay, in that case, the proton, you stop the, the, the beam, proton or the tyrant, you stop it in the SIG target. Okay, and there are some facilities which propose both uh, kind of, uh, of, of, of spectrum. 
So okay, here you have a scheme of different quasi-monotic facilities. Uh, you see, uh, we saw this one uh, yesterday, I think so. Uh, you, have, you produce your neutron here, and here you have some uh, collimated, uh, collimator which allow to, to define you a neutron beam, uh, beam line. So you, you can have some details on a report concerning this, and you can also have uh, a list of uh, facilities in, uh, in this report from IEA. Uh, concerning the time of fly uh, facilities. So, uh, okay, this, okay. Really, I think you, you know that uh, quite well now, production of quasi monetic neutron with accelerator. This, what I want to mention, here you have a neutron spectrum performed on DD reaction. Here you use a, a deterrent of uh, more than 3 MeV. At, at zero degree, you have an energy of uh, 6.8 uh, MeV. And when you increase uh, the deuteron energy, you, you have breakup reaction and your spectrum is no more purely monokinetic. But uh, for NXN reaction, for at least for N2N reaction, sometimes it's not a problem because your threshold of reaction is somewhere here and this part of neutrons doesn't uh, impact your reaction. It was mentioned, uh, I think, yesterday uh, already. Uh, okay, and if you increase uh, the, the energy, you also increase the, the part of the, of the breakup reaction, but for the same reason, it's sometimes still usable. So you can also use Palachian reactions. Uh, okay, I think you had uh, also explanation, uh, I think, Monday by, uh, by Nicola. Here you have a neutron spectrum of uh, NTOF. You have a continuous neutron spectrum, and you cover... Uh, uh, low energy part, which is not very interesting for an Nixon reaction, but you cover energy part uh, more uh, uh, above the 100 of keV uh, up to several tenths of MeV in order to, to study the, the reaction uh, we are interested in. So, uh, just a few words about uh, the type of beam. So, you can have what I call open field. That's uh, the case, for example, in, uh, in PTB, but you can uh, find that also in other facilities uh, around the world. And you have the neutron source uh, somewhere. It's uh, the target, okay? And neutrons are emitted in 4 pi. That's why you call that an open source, okay? And the consequence is that your detector is not protected and you have background in your detector. That's exactly the case I mentioned uh, in my previous talk with the uh, thorium uh, neutron induced fission uh, studies. Okay, and, uh, but the advantage is that you can put your samples usually very close to the neutron source in order to have a, a large uh, flux. You have a collimated beam, in that case, uh, I repeat, it's uh, neutron are produced here. You have collimators, and you have your neutron beam, which uh, really a neutron beam. The advantage is you can put your sample here and your detector close to the sample, but quite uh, outside of the neutron beam, but not in the background. But the problem in that case, in this case, uh, in this case, is as you are quite far from the target, you decrease your, your available flux. And there is another, uh, an, another type of facility which produces what I call a conical beam. I'm not sure it's a, it's a good, the good name, but uh, you use a reaction where key key, for key key kinematic reason, uh, neutrons are produced in a, in, a, in a certain cone. And outside of the cone, at larger angle, you don't have any more neutrons. So it means that you can put your detector outside of, uh, of the neutron beam. So now uh, we'll look how we can measure this uh, cross-section of this kind of, uh, of experiment. So uh, I, I will show you three techniques. Uh, activation techniques, the NN prime, uh, the NXN gamma reaction uh, measurement, and the direct measurement of uh, secondary red neutrons. So activation technique, uh, it was explained, uh, I think it was two days by, by, by Vitaly. Uh, okay, you radiate uh, a new, uh, samples of nuclei I by your neutrons, and you produce this daughter nuclei, and you measure the activity of uh, this nuclei. And if you know the flux, the number of atoms you have in your samples, from the activity, you can deduce uh, the cross-section. But, but... To, uh, to be able to use this technique, your daughter should be radioactive. Right, there are other solutions if you use a mass spectrometer, but it's uh, not exactly uh, the same technique. But in, the in most of cases, uh, you use a radioactive technique. 
adjective sample, sorry. So, and again, I repeat, uh, it was mentioned before, uh, to be uh, available, you need measurable period. You need a decay mode, which is measurable, gamma, alpha, electrons. And you need a good feeding ratio, because if uh, you take a nuclei which decay uh, 10 to the minus 4 to, to, to photons, for example, it will be difficult to measure the activity by detecting photons. And also, uh, the value of the feeding ratio is important, but the knowledge of the feeding ratio is also important. Okay, uh, okay what is, uh, what, uh, okay, I uh, didn't mention, uh, sometimes it's, it's also called radiochemical uh, technique. What is, uh, what are the advantages? So, as you measure the activity uh, mainly by gamma spectroscopy or by alpha spectroscopy, uh, you can clearly identify your daughter nuclei. So it means that your target do not need to be isotropic. If you have several uh, isotopes in your target, okay, it doesn't matter, you can identify the, the one uh, you are interested on. You don't need a pulse beam because you just put on your radiation and then you make a counting rate. You, know, you, radiate. you just need to know uh, how long you have irradiated and how many particles, how many neutrons you have, uh, you have sunk. So if you if your beam is not constant, sometimes you could have to make some correction in respect to, to the half-life you are measuring. But what is the drawback? The drawback is, as you don't have any information of the time of your action, you can't measure the incident neutron by time of fly. So it means that you need to have a monokinetic neutrons. If you don't have, you will have to make some corrections. You can measure only one energy at one time, of course, and you need one target for each energy. Okay, it seems, uh, okay, not a problem. But if you want to work with actinide target, with a radioactive target, with a rare target, if you, it's sometimes it's difficult to have several targets. So I have put an example uh, of the N2N -N reaction on americium-248. So I didn't know, but uh, you have a poster uh, on, this, uh, on this subject uh, just here. Uh, it was a measurement performed at uh, IRMM. You can find some detail in this uh, PhD thesis. And it's uh, uh, quite special because your, your, your target is radioactive. Americium-241 is uh, quite highly radioactive. So it means that you can't have a really uh, a large amount of materials. So, and it is radioactive, so you will have a lot of background in your, in your detection system. So uh, you see, you have your americium-249, you uh, capture a neutron, you emit two neutrons, and you detect the gamma ray uh, emitted by the americium-240. Okay, so you need to detect this kind of gamma. Uh, okay, and this one has a period of only uh, 50, uh, 50 hours. Here you have a gamma spectrum uh, measured before the radiation and after the radiation. And you see that they are succeed to measure a, a gamma ray at uh, 987 kV, uh, which correspond to this to this transition. Okay, you measure the activity and you can deduce uh, the cross section. <coughs> and, uh, with uh, this, you can uh, determine uh, cross section at different energy, and it was performed with monokinetic uh, neutrons sources. Okay, so you can uh, find more detail, I think, uh, uh, on, the, on the poster you have here. So now uh, we'll switch to another uh, technique, which uh, in this technique we measure the NXN gamma uh, cross-section, not the NXN. So how, how it looks like. You, you have your samples, you have your neutron, uh, neutron beam, and you detect with a set of gamma detectors, you detect the gamma rays. Not, not the neutron, but the gamma rays uh, emitted uh, during this reaction. So what is uh, the advantage of this uh, such a reaction? So as you detect gamma rays, you have a, a time, a time signal. So it means that if your beam uh, is pulsed, by time of flight, you can measure the incident energy, the energy of the incident neutrons. It means also that you can use it, this technique, with a continuous neutron beam. And as a consequence, you can measure several incident neutron energy in the same, uh, in the same measurement. Okay? 
Again, you identify the gamma rays from the, the nuclei. So again, you can uh, you don't need a, a mono uh, monoisotopic uh, target. So you can even measure several isotopes in the same in the same experiment. Now, the main drawback of this uh, of this technique is that you don't measure the NXN cross section, but you measure the NXN gamma cross section. In fact, you measure just one part of the uh, cross section you are looking at. So here you have an example of a such experiment uh, also performed at Gale, but in time at, uh, at Gelina and not at the Van de Graaff. So uh, you already know this uh, this facility. And here you have the setup, uh, this set of uh, of a germanium detector surrounding the target. And, uh, in addition, there are also other detectors at a dedicated angle. Okay, the target is here. Uh, the beam comes from that position, I think so. And here you have the detector here. Uh, you can have a lot of detail in uh, so many publications we've done. We are done. We have a lot of uh, different uh, cross section of uh, NN prime on N to N, which have been uh, measured on this uh, on these isotopes. Here also you have the list uh, of uh, the measure or the, the the isotope which are scheduled to be to be measured. So uh, here is an example of the measurement of NN prime on N to N gamma uh, cross section. On your M5, here you take here there's the detail of uh, of the target, huh? uh, okay, and as you have the time of flight between your rea your reaction and your beam, you have the the time of flight of the incident neutrons, and you can select which kind of uh, the energy range you are interested on. For example, here it's the time of arriving of the of the gamma rays. Okay, you have gamma produced during the photo photo reaction in the accelerator, and you detect gamma also in your detector. That's the time of arrival of your gamma, and then when the time increases, you have the neutrons, and the farther you are here, the lower energy is, are the neutrons. So if you select this energy range, you have. In, you are in the NN prime uh, energy uh, gate, and you select this part. It corresponds to the energy of the end to end reactions. Now, if you look at uh, the spectrum of uh, the gamma spectrum, uh, this gamma spectrum on NN prime gamma reaction, you can identify some uh, transition. In fact, in, in this case, it's one transition, the one 129 keV, which corresponding uh, to an excited level of your num 235. If you identify these three energy uh, transition, three gamma ray transition, it corresponds to three uh, transition of level of uranium-234, because in that case, you produce the N to N gamma reaction. Okay. So if you count the number of gammas of uh, this energy range, of, uh, this energy range you can deduce the N XN gamma cross-section. <laughs> so how do you do? OK, you have your target, your beam, you have your detectors. And you deduce your cross section at an angle, c'est ça, by the number of, uh, of gamma you have in your peak, uh, number of atoms, your flux, your detection efficiency, the relation time. So you have to take into account uh, the, the dead time of the acquisition. Okay. So, but here you have measured the cross section at one angle. And what you want is the total cross section over all the angles. So, and for that, you can use, you have to, the cross section you want to measure is this one. You, you have to integrate this cross section over 4 pi. So you make this kind of integration over solid angle. Then you can uh, integrate over phi by 2 pi. You have 2 pi, it's phi. And then you can change uh, of reference coming from theta to cosine, cosine is theta. And you have an integration between minus 1 and 1 of this. Uh, uh, of this formula. And then you can use the Gaussian quadrature approximation, which gives you this, the value of this integral. It's equal to this one as a condition that your theta here, or your cos theta here, correspond to a value for which the Legendre polynomial is equal to zero. So an example, if you take the Legendre polynomial of order n equal 4, you have four roots, which are this one, that's the roots. The roots are the value for which the polynomial, uh, random polynomial is equal to zero. And if you put your, uh, your detector at angles for which the cosine of the angle is equal to this value, 
you can apply this formula. In fact, you can apply this formula. You, you have the value you have measured you, to your two angles, okay, the angles for which the polynomium is equal to zero, and you have some coefficient with our, which are known, and so by placing your detector at these two angles, three, uh, three de uh, 30 degrees and 70 degrees, you can deduce from the measurement of only with two, only two angles, you can deduce the, uh, the cross-section of NX and gamma reaction. Okay? So it's very well explained in this, uh, in this reference. So now the problem, and it's the, the drawback of this method, in fact, that you don't measure NXN reaction, in that case N to N, but you measure N to N gamma reaction. So in, you measure the, only one part of the cross-section. And you have to, to go from here, or here you have the uh, results, here for different energy, uh, energy bin, you have the cross-section measure of, maybe you, you can't see, but it's for a transition, uh, is a six plus to four plus, this one is a six plus to, uh, eight plus to six plus, and this one 10 plus to eight plus. So, and to go from this transition to the Nixon transition, you need to make a, 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 a theoretical calculation. And when you make this calculation with a Thales code, for example, you see that uh, the, the ratio between this transition, it's uh, the first transition at 150 kV, to the end-to-end -end, uh, cross-section, you see you have a large factor of uh, correction. So it means that uh, if you want to, to, to be able to perform this kind of measurement, you must trust your... Uh, simulation uh, from uh, going from the NXN gamma to the NXN reaction. <coughs> so another kind of reaction which uh, looks like a little bit to the previous one, that's a measurement performed at NLB. <coughs> uh, NLB is in uh, Rosendorf in, in Germany and neutrons are produced by photofission and you have a, a channel for, uh, for neutrons and here you have the energy range covered is uh, up to 10 MV, but a little bit, uh, a little bit less. Again, I didn't know, but again, you have a poster on this uh, kind of measurement here, on the study of NN primary on, on, uh, on iron. And in that case, uh, there is a, a coincidence measurement between the gamma rays and a neutron emitting. Okay? Uh, so, so here you have a picture of uh, the facility. Uh, the, the sample is, uh, is here. Here you have plastic scintillator for neutron detection. Okay, that scintillator uh, with two phototubes, the same type as I mentioned in the previous lecture. And here you have BF3 detector to detect the gamma ray. So the flux is determined. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> The incident flux is determined by a uh, fission chamber. <coughs> Sorry. I hope I will finish the lecture. <laughs> Alive. Again, you can find some uh, all the detail on the, in, the, in the thesis, or oh, also you can uh, find detail on the, on the poster, on the, on the reaction, so at the, the distance. Okay, and here is a typical spectrum which is measured. Here you have the time of flight between the, the, the accelerator and the, and the detection. This peak corresponds to, to the gamma flash, the photo flash. And here correspond with this time of flight, you can deduce the neutron energy. And here you have different, that's uh, the gamma uh, energy detected. And you can distinguish different uh, gamma lines which correspond to different transitions of the ion uh, uh, 56. Okay? You can see also, for example, this, 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 this line due to potassium 40. <coughs> you have any idea where this potassium 40 comes from? No? Okay, nothing to do with ion. In fact, you have potassium-40 in uh, every concrete, in all the concrete. So, and you have concrete uh, all around the, the cave. So you always have this gamma line at, uh, at uh, 1,460 uh, uh, kV. So, 
<coughs> so, but again, what you measure, it's not the NXN reaction, but the NXN gamma reaction. And here you have some results obtained uh, uh, the transition on different states. Uh, an energy heave can you give you uh, the cross-section of uh, the transition of two, of two states. And then again, to switch from these results to the NXN results, you have to make uh, TALIS uh, calculations. Or TALIS or other calculation, but usually we use uh, the TALIS code. So now, uh, third part, in that case, we will, okay, we have measured the activation of the daughter nuclei. Here we have measured gamma rays, or coincidence for neutron gamma, in order to detect, to measure the NXN gamma uh, cross-section. Now, if we can also measure the, directly the neutron emitted and measure directly the NXN uh, reaction. So, what are the advantages? In that case, it's a direct measurement. We don't need a uh, calculation uh, of uh, feeding ratio or uh, alimentation. It's applicable to all nuclei. You don't need to have a daughter radioactive. Okay. What is the drawback? The back is you need, in that, in that case, you need a monoisotopic mono target because as you don't detect gamma rays, you can't identify the nuclei uh, on which, the nucleus on which you made your reaction. And also, you need a neutron detector uh, of high efficiency. And two kinds of detectors can be used, the neutron balls uh, and the neutron spectrometer. <coughs> and the, the goal is to measure uh, X neutron you are emitted. If you want to measure N to N reaction, you have to measure the two neutrons and to N the three neutrons emitted in the reaction. So, a few words about the neutron balls. What is neutron ball? Uh, a neutron ball is a neutron detector, uh, a large neutron detector, uh, spherical or with different size, but uh, different shape, but it doesn't matter. Your, your sample is in the center and it's a tank which is filled by a uh, scintillator liquid and it is surrounded by phototube. Okay, here you have a picture on the old one, uh, which was used in the 70s. Uh, at that time, you, you could uh, buy it directly to, to the producer. Now you have to, to build it yourself. Uh, this one, Orion, uh, was used in the past at Ganil, and this was it uh, four cubic meters of uh, volume. Uh, and Carmen, he was, uh, he was built uh, 15 years ago uh, in CA. Uh, it's a little bit less, uh, one, uh, 1,000 liter and 24 uh, phototube. Well, it's a uh, four pi neutron detector. It's a very high efficient and also high uh, sensitive. You can use it by, for NXN cross section measurements. I will show you uh, how. You can also measure to measure new bar. New bar is the average number of neutrons emitted in fission. Okay. And you can also use for the study of uh, hot nuclei because uh, hot nuclei decay mainly by neutron emission. Okay, how it works. I, show, I said you it's filled by a liquid scintillator and surrounded by phototube. You have your target, which emits neutrons. Neutrons enter in the liquid scintillator. Okay, the liquid scintillator is mainly composed of hydrogen nuclei and carbon nuclei. The neutron eats on the uh, hydrogen nuclei, on protons, and lose its energy by several uh, heats in that. Proton heated, recoil, and when they recoil, they are stopped in the liquid and it produces light because it's a scintillator, okay? And this light is detected by the phototube. This process is quite short, several nanoseconds, several tens of nanoseconds. So it means we have a so-called prompt pit. Then neutrons continue to be slowed down in the scintillator until it's thermalized. And then when it's thermalized, it continues to live until it's captured by gadolinium nuclei. I didn't mention, but in this scintillator, they are loaded by less than 1% of gadolinium. Why gadolinium? Because gadolinium has a very, very large, very huge uh, neutron conception, uh, neutron capture conception, more than uh, two, uh, two, 250,000 of bonds for one of the isotopes. Okay, so then when the neutron is captured by the gadolinium, the gadolinium is excited and it excites by emitting gamma rays. In average, three gamma rays and for a total energy of around 80 MeV. And these gamma rays, they also uh, interact with the electron of, of the liquid and produce light uh, in the scintillator and this light is detected by the phototube. 
So what is uh, the interest of this detector? The interest is you, you put very small quantity of gadolinium. It means that the times between the thermalization and the capture is quite long. Here you have the time distribution of the capture, the capture time distribution of the neutron by gadolinium nuclei. And as the concentration is slow, the time of capture is quite long. You need 50 microseconds in order to capture 99% of the neutron you will capture. And why do we use a so low uh, time distribution? It means that if you have several neutrons emitted at the same time, all your capture won't uh, happen at the same time. And you can count your capture independently. So it means that when you have a reaction, you wait uh, several tens of nanoseconds, 100 nanoseconds, that this prompt peak has been uh, detected. And then you open a gate to count the delayed, the delayed signals. And here you count the delayed signals. Or in that case, you count four delayed signals in 50 microseconds. So you have four capture of neutrons. If the concentration have been larger, this, this distribution would be shorter, and you have a probability that two neutrons will be captured at the same time, and you can't distinguish. So, and with a so low uh, concentration, you can measure very high neutron multiplicity. It has no interest for end-to-end -end or end-to-end -end reaction, but when you use spallation reaction and you use uh, uh, heavy ion reaction, you have a multiplicity of 10, 20, 50, you can measure it. So, but this kind of detector is quite large. It is also very sensitive to background because it's sensitive to neutrons, but also to photons. So what we do after the measurement of this uh, neutron is the first gate. We open a second gate later, which is, uh, which measure evaluate the background, which, because this gate is not correlated to to this one in time, okay. So uh, the advantage also of this detector because it's very efficient. Here you have a, a, the efficiency uh, detection efficiency as a function of the neutron energy in the center, and you see that you have close to 80 percent of detection efficiency at low energy. This, en this efficiency decreases with uh, with energy for uh, for two reasons. The first one is that when neutrons energy increases. Uh, the probability of the neutron to escape of the detector increases. But the main reason is that uh, when you increase the energy, you have new uh, channel reaction which can open, and this reaction, um, uh, you, your neutron disappears. So that's why uh, we could say, okay, I will increase my volume in order to increase efficiency, but it's not a good solution because you, won't, you will increase a little bit your efficiency, but you will mainly increase the background sensitivity of your detector. And you will increase the volume of liquid, which is expensive, which is a poison, which is explosive, uh, which is uh, cancerous. Okay, it's, uh, the people of safety, they don't like at all this kind of detector. Okay, how we can measure the efficiency of this kind of detector? Again, we use a, a Californium source. You put your Californium source in the center of the detector. Uh, you put the, the source on a silicon detector. When you detect a fission fragment, you know that, in average, you have 3.78 neutrons emitted by the californium. And also the advantage of the kind of detector that, okay, you can measure your neutrons, but you measure also, not, you don't measure the average number of neutrons, but you measure the neutron multiplicity, event by event. It means that here you have a spectrum of uh, the multiplicity measurement. You measure the number of events with zero neutron emitted, one neutron emitted, two neutron emitted, three neutron emitted. You measure the neutron multiplicity. Okay? You have to correct for uh, multiplicity of background, of course, but you have to do that. And you do that event by event. Okay. So how we use it for this, this kind of detector for uh, NXN measurement? So you put your sample, your detector here, the samples in, in, in the center. You need, uh, yeah, you need absolutely a collimated neutron beam because the detector is very sensitive uh, to all, all the other neutrons. And you see, you, you need a very clean uh, area in terms of background. It means also that if you put a wall here, it won't work because your neutron won't go to the wall and go back to, to the detector and create a, a large background. Okay. You need to measure your uh, flux by your monitor. Okay. And 
what you will measure, you measure the number, the multiplicity of, uh, of uh, uh, the number of events with multiplicity x. For example, if you are looking of an end-to-end -end reaction, you will look on your distribution the number of, of counts with multiplicity 2. And you have to correct uh, for the efficiency, the number of atoms and, and, and the flux. Okay? So, one of the problems is you have a passive target. Okay? So, you, 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 you have to use a pulse beam. You pulse the beam and you open a gate in order to count the number of neutrons you have. So, in, in the, the, this kind of experiment, which are uh, presented here, uh, they use three three successive uh, pulse in order to increase the statistic. Uh, in fact, you have no chance or the probability of having a reaction in two or three uh, successive builds is very, very, very low. But you have to open a gate quite long, uh, here, uh, around 40 microseconds. <coughs> so, uh, by using this kind of technique, you can measure end-to-end uh, -end on any uh, cross-section that you have some results uh, which are obtained uh, by this kind of detector. Again, it's done by monokinetic neutrons, and you have a lot of uh, points to do. And when you arrive to some kind of energy above uh, 11 or 12 MeV, I, as I said you before, your spectrum is not purely monokinetic, so you have to make some correction of reaction which have occurred at energy a little bit lower. Okay, uh, that's other measurement performed with uh, another uh, compar other team. But in this uh, in these plots, you have data obtained by this technique, but also data obtained by activation technique. So other uh, possibility to to measure the, this reaction is to use a neutron spectrometer. Uh, it's uh, it was mainly used for NN prime reaction. <coughs> so what is a what is called a neutron spectrometer. So you have your production of neutrons here, for example, a proton beam on, on the target, or a deuteron beam on the target, okay? Here you have the samples you want to study, and here you put some neutron detector at different angles, okay? And you will use a, a pulse beam in order to measure the energy, or at least the fly path of the neutron from here to here, okay? And one of the difficulties here, you need flux, so you need to be quite close. If you want to be close, you can't use a collimated beam. Okay, so you have to be in open source. And the problem is that you, what you want to measure is the neutron coming from there, not the one coming from the source. And the one has much more numerous than this one. So that's why you need to make a very a lot of shielding in order that your detector see neutrons coming from the samples and not coming from the source. Okay? Here you have to put a monitor in order to be able to normalize your, your experiment. Uh, okay, here you see you have the fly path here, which is also important. I will come it uh, later. What it looks like, okay, here you have a picture of a neutron spectrometer which was used at, uh, at CA in the 80s. Uh, here you have the, the beam line. The accelerator is some, somewhere here. Okay, and you have a special uh, treatment of your uh, your signal in order to reduce uh, the the time pulse, and and they, they, they succeed to have a, a time resolution uh, below one nanoseconds. Okay, the sample is here, and here your dete your detector are inside this uh, big shielding which are composed of uh, paraffin and uh, lithium-6 uh, and, uh, and boron, okay? And here you have some collimator also. Now, if I will look more, here you have the shallow cone in order to define here the channel for detection of the neutrons. And here you have some, uh, some shielding because here the, the source is here and you don't want to see the neutrons from here. And the samples can be from out or in here, okay? Uh, in addition, at that time, uh, this target was a tritium gas target. Okay. Uh, but they use a tritium or also deuterium target in order to, to, to cover different energy. So, neutron energy, okay, you already know uh, what is a neutron by term of light. But what I want to, to just point out something in that case, we never measure an absolute time. Okay, because we don't know uh, the length of the cable, we don't know the time spent in the electronics. What we measure, it's a difference, okay? So the time of fly is the time you measure 
minus a certain constant due to the electronic and minus the times of the neutrons between their emission and the samples. So, and if you want to, to be able to measure really the, the, the time of life of neutrons, this time of neutrons must be constant. It means that you must have constant, uh, monokinetic neutrons in order that this time must be constant. And then, <coughs> What you measure, the time of flight uh, you, you, you measure, you have a constant. What is this constant? In fact, we determine this constant by using the gamma rays. Because the gamma rays, they always take the same time to, to, the, to, to fly on this path. And this time is equal to the distance divided by the, by, by the velocity of, of light. So, uh, it was explained uh, yesterday or not two days ago uh, by Jan. But what I want to stress is that what we measure is a difference of time between neutrons and gammas. Okay? Here you have a direct time of line uh, spectrum that corresponds to the array of, of gamma rays. I measure this time because I can measure it's the same cables, it's the same electronics. You just have to know uh, the ratio between your channel or your, your time measurement in, in your TAC or in your TDC. Okay? And uh, with this measurement, this difference, you can measure your neutron <coughs> time of line. So let's go back to this uh, spectrometer. So here you have some results on osmium, but it doesn't matter. What we have measured, in fact, in this neutron, it's a time of fly, okay? And here you have this kind of time of fly. Uh, that's, it's, it's in channel, but okay, you don't have the, the, the number. And here, uh, again, it's realizing inverse time of fly method. It means that the, the fastest neutrons arrive uh, uh, the uh, fastest photons arrive at long time of flight uh, because we start the measurement by the detection of neutrons and we stop by the accelerator, which is delayed. Okay. So it doesn't matter. So here you have the time distribution corresponding to a scal elastic scattering of neutrons on osmium. In that case, it's osmium 190. And here, these neutrons have a less, little bit less energy because they have been uh, emitted uh, from the uh, first uh, for, for this uh, the decay of this uh, excited state, okay? And if you know the time, you see, the, the, you, you know the time between different peaks, you can deduce the energy corresponding corresponding energy of the different time, okay? And in that sense, you can deduce this one is elastic, this one is the first excited state, this one is the second excited state, and, and so and so. Okay, here you have the results on osmium uh, 190, and this one is on 192. Okay. Okay, another application on the uranium uh, NN prime on uranium 238. And this one is a little bit special because you can see that the first excited level is at 45 keV. It's quite small. It means that between your elastic and your first excited state, you are only 45 keV in difference. It means that your time of flight will be very, very close, one for each other. I made just a small calculation with a fly path of 8 meters, correspond to the, to the spectrometer I show you. Uh, and here, that results at 1.5 MeV. Okay, at 1.5 MeV, the time of flight is 295 uh, nanoseconds, and the first excited state in only 5 nanoseconds later. That means that if you want to be able to measure this kind of measurement, you need a spectrometer with very, very good energy resolution. And good energy resolution is good time resolution on long fly path. And long fly path, it means low counting rate. I just put you here a contrary estimation. If you put uh, a flux, which can be, okay, you can reach a ten, a 3, 10 to the 8 neutron per, per square centimeter, uh, no, per steradion per second. If you put a sample of 30 grams, I, I put the example of uh, osmium, okay? If you put a distance of 7 centimeters, here I put a cross-section of 10 milliband per steranium, but in some, for some angles, it can be less than that, okay? And we put a detector of 8 meters, a detector of a radius of uh, 5 inches, no, of a diameter of 5 inches, so you can calculate the number of counts you will, will have, and it's more or less one count per, per second. So, now, uh, you can also perform this kind of NXN measurement by using a multi-cell detector. Uh, yeah, in that case, 
the detector are not in the shielding. They are uh, around here. It's uh, the Figaro facility, which is used at, uh, at Los Alamos, at the WNR uh, facilities. And in that case, they use a continuous neutron beam, and they need a start signal. That's why they use this kind of detector, a BF3, uh, to detect uh, the gamma ray. So in that case, uh, they, they use it for NN prime resonance. So they, use, they measure the neutron, but they measure also the gammas in order to be able to, to measure that. <coughs> so it, uh, okay, the detector are also uh, liquid scintillator detector. So uh, very short, I, I just spoke to you about cross-section measurement, but we are also interested not only to measure the cross-section, but also to measure the energy of the neutron emitted. Or the technique is quite the same than the, the one I, I showed you previously. So I find it's a quite uh, old publication, but you, you can find uh, another one. It's always the same thing. You have your, your neutron emission, your samples. You need a shielding in order to that your detector see neutron emitted by your samples. And here you have the time of flight measurement, and you can uh, show the elastic on the other neutron coming from the other reaction. This one is on lead, and this one is on carbon you see the different peak, it corresponds to the excited level on, on carbon, at uh, minus 4 MeV, minus 7, and so on. And you can translate this kind of, uh, neutron, of, uh, of time of flight spectra uh, to a neutron energy spectrum, and you have also the elastic, the first excited state, and so on. But the problem of this technique is what you measure, it's the neutron coming from all the channels where at least one neutron has been emitted. It means you measure in the same times an n prime and two n and three n, so or n n n b if, if it exists. So you cannot say I have my spec, my neutron spec of n to n or my spec of n three n. It's a sum of of a wall. So another kind of experiment which was performed on uh, on lead uh, in that case, and you can see the, the results here uh, at 60 degree. It was 14 MeV, you understand why, huh? because uh, 14 MeV, it's uh, quite easy to have a neutron source. And you have the elastic component, and you have this uh, component due to N to N. OK. <coughs> OK. Uh, in, that case, in that case, they can say it's N to N, but uh, it could <coughs> be an N, N prime also. But they, 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 they are sure it's not N to N, because we are below the threshold of N to N reaction. So now I will uh, give you some examples of experiment, taking into account all you have learned during this, uh, this lecture. I will go to this end-to-end -end reaction on plutonium-9. And I will show you that this cross-section uh, have, been, have been measured with the three techniques I mentioned before. Okay? So again, plutonium is uh, a radioactive target. It's less radioactive than americium, but it's radioactive. And uh, the daughter uh, nuclei is a plutonium-238, which is quite highly radioactive with a period of, uh, of uh, 80, uh, 87 euro. Uh, and it, it, it emits uh, alpha at this energy, and it emits a lot of alphas. When you use plutonium-238, usually you are, your setup is added, hidden by uh, the high alpha activities. So, uh, activation techniques. So here you have an example. Uh, you have the reference here uh, of uh, what was done by uh, activation techniques. Uh, they did it by uh, at uh, 14 MeV. Here you have the flux, you have the integral experience. So, what is the difficulties in that case? In that case, is uh, you you have to measure at the end. You have to measure plutonium eight, okay, and uh, the problem. In the samples, is that you need a very pure samples. Okay, and here that, that's a major problem because when you have a sample of plutonium, usually you have several isotopes. And in, if you have a, a pollution of uranium 238, you can't succeed your experiment. So in this case, they had a purity of 6, 10 to minus 10 before before the radiation. Okay, and uh, what they measure in that case the plutonium, they didn't try to measure the gamma rays, but they measure the alpha rays, because I said to you that it's very active in gamma rays. So here you have uh, the alpha spectrum of the, the samples. Before irradiation, it was in red, okay? And after irradiation, this, this is uh, one of the alpha of the plutonium-9, okay? 
So, and uh, wh wh what you saw, I, I made a, a small calculation uh, of that, con taking into account this integrated fluence, which is given here, uh, and the cross section, and uh, uh, we can obtain uh, an activation of two, two Becquerel, okay? But here, we obtain 10 to the 9 uh, atom of plutonium-8, and you have to compare to the number of atoms you have at the beginning. So that's why you very really need a very uh, pure, uh, pure target here. So, second method, uh, which has been, uh, was used, it's the uh, NN prime gamma uh, method. It was uh, performed at uh, LANS, at the Los Alamos National Center, by using the Geni detector. Uh, okay, again, uh, neutrons are emitted by, uh, are produced by spallation. You have high energy proton it in a thick target. You have neutrons going through these collimators. That's a continuous beam, so uh, here you have the uh, extended uh, time uh, distribution of neutrons. And the target is at the center, and you have a lot of uh, germanium detector uh, in order to measure the gamma rays. And in addition, you have uh, Bejo escape suppression to, 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 to clean up your, your spectrum. So, and here you have the kind of uh, spectra which uh, have been measured. Uh, as uh, you have a pulse beam, you can uh, uh, select some uh, energy, uh, energy domain of interest and you detect uh, the gamma rays, uh, which are characteristic uh, from transition of the plutonium-8. So here you have the, this peak correspond to this transition, this one to this one, and this one to this one. And you, detect, you, you determine the cross-section of this level, and again, you need calculation in order to determine the cross-section of the end-to-end -end reaction. So, last method used also for this kind of actinide is to use the famous neutron ball I, uh, I showed you previously. And, okay, the advantage is, in that case, we don't need any uh, theoretical calculation because we directly measure the Nixon question. But when I say directly, okay, not so direct. Why? Because in your reaction, you will have some fission. You will have end to end, you will have end and prime maybe N3N if you have above the threshold of N3N reaction. So, what happens? If you make this measurement, uh, you will have this neutron distribution, neutron multiplicity distribution due to fission. Okay, that's typical to a, a fission. So, the contribution of the fission of plutonium, you will obtain this distribution. And in addition, you will have Okay, uh, that's the, the, the reverse, okay. In, in, uh, okay. The blue is the distribution you, you measure, the neutron multiplicity you measure, and in this, this distribution, you have the contribution of fission. And you know that above a multiplicity of two, this part is only due to fission. Okay? We know the fission probability of, uh, of, this, uh, of this isotope, so you can say that I normalize on that part, we can say this is fission, and that part is not fission. And this, this uh, subtraction of the two values allow us to go back to the end-to-end uh, -end cost section measurement. But as you see, so, uh, in fact, that's, uh, that's the formula you, you use, uh, okay? The number of fission for uh, multiplicity greater than four uh, is equal to the number you detect divided by the by, by the fission probability. And then you can measure the end to end on end to end if the energy uh, is high enough uh, relative to cost. But here the problem, one of the problem of uh, this method is that you have to subtract two values, okay, and the uncertainty can be very huge. Okay. So here it's a summarize of the results obtained on this uh, plutonium two of the end-to-end -end reaction on, on plutonium-9 uh, by uh, taking the three methods I just uh, showed you before. And you see that there are some discrepancies uh, between the data, especially in the threshold energy region uh, where uh, the cross-section is quite low, okay? And it's a region which is very interesting because it corresponds to, to the Q of the fission spectrum. That to say that uh, new experiments are forcing for such uh, such a measurement. 
So, uh, now another special measurement concerning the end-to-end -end reaction on deuterium. And this one is a little bit special because uh, in the previous epan, uh, remind what I said at the beginning, uh, one part of the neutron are evaporated, okay? That's uh, by the compound nuclear. And it's evaporation, it's a statistical process. Okay, you have a certain energy, uh, energy range. In this case, you, you send a neutron on a deuterium and you obtain a proton on two neutrons. And in fact, you have a three, three body reactions. And these three, reactions, these three uh, particles are strongly uh, correlated in energy and in, in anger. Okay. So, and in order to, to, to try to, to, to simulate this kind of process, you have to, to solve the FEDEF equation, and uh, it's quite interesting uh, for, for the theoreticians. Okay. So, how do, did we proceed to, to, the, to, the, to do this kind of, uh, of experiment? We also use a uh, neutron ball, but uh, what was interesting that we use an active target. It means that our target was a, a liquid scintillator of C6D6, okay? That's uh, such a detector. Such a detector are used, for example, from uh, from capture measurement uh, at Entoff, for example. But in our case, it was a target. It means that in the target we have deuterium. Okay. And the advantage of that, what, why is it active target? Because when you make this reaction, you have a proton which is produced, and the proton in the scintillator it produces light. It means that we have signals. We have a trigger, and this trigger allows us to measure the neutron energy of the incoming neutrons, and it allows also to trigger the detection of the neutrons. So when we have a, a, a signal here, we open our counting gate, and we count the number of neutrons, your neutron distribution, the distribution of these neutrons, okay? One problem, in this target there are carbon, okay? And around the, the target, there is uh, the aluminum, there is uh, also. So, to avoid this, we have to do the same measurement with a C6H6 target. The composition is the same, but the hydrogen is replaced by, uh, the deuterium is replaced by hydrogen. Results. Here it's a spectrum we have obtained, incident spectrum we have obtained, the time between our active target and our accelerator. Okay? We are sensitive to gamma rays, and the neutrons of interest and are the neutrons coming from the uh, uh, from the uh, from the breakup reactions. Okay. You see, we have two gamma rays. You see, in fact, because uh, the beam was uh, was hitting uh, something in the beam one or two meter upstream of the of the target. That's why we have two today. So, by time of fly, you can say, okay, I will select this event. This event have an energy corresponding to nine MeV, and I will select this event which have an energy corresponding to three point four seven MeV. So here you have, we have the multiplicity neutron multiplicity distribution we have measured with the C6 target and with the C6H6 target. And here for gamma, uh, I select this event, and you see I have only multiplicity zero. Here for this uh, energy neutrons, I have multiplicity zero, multiplicity one, and multiplicity two. For C6D6 and for C6H6, I have no multiplicity two because at this energy range, at 9 MeV, I am below the end-to-end -end threshold of carbon. The end-to-end -end threshold of carbon is 19 MeV. Okay. And at uh, 3.7 MeV, I have this kind of distribution. So you can see that I have no more uh, <coughs> multiplicity 2 because I am, uh, I, am, I think I don't remember exactly the threshold, uh, the threshold is. Uh, I, 3.3 MeV, the special of reaction. So here at 3.7, I'm very close to, to the special. So it means uh, alors, why I have multiplicity 1, 1 and multiplicity 2 uh, for several reasons. Multiplicity 1, we have the elastic scattering in the target, and we have also an end to end reaction from, when, from which only one neutron has been detected, okay, because the detector is not 1% efficient. So again, to uh, deduce the cross section, you have to know the number of uh, of events with a multiplicity two in the C6D6 minus the, the one of multiplicity two in C6H6. Okay, and you know, need to know your flux, your efficiency, and the number of atoms. 
And uh, with this method, we uh, succeed to measure the cross-section at different uh, energy uh, of the end-to-end -end, uh, reaction of, uh, of deuterium. So now, I will, to finish, I will present you two experiments, uh, future experiments, uh, that will be performed at the NFS facility, and uh, later of intense have been estimated. Okay, the first one uh, is an interesting because we will try to measure an entry and cross-section measurement by two different techniques, namely the direct uh, the activation technique and the NXN gamma reaction at the same time. Okay, the, the experiment will be an entry and reaction on zirconium 90. Okay, by by one way, we measure the gamma rays of different uh, transition of zirconium 88. That's the technique I show you. We have performed, uh, not we, uh, they have performed at, uh, at Gelina. Okay? But at the end of the experiment, in fact, this nuclei is reactive and decay on the yttrium. And so we can measure the uh, activation, the activity of this uh, decay by the activation technique. It means that by the two methods, we will obtain this end-to-end -end cross section. That is particularly interesting because uh, uh, for this one, we just need to know the thinning ratio, and we will be able to check if the uh, calculation made to go from n 3 n gamma to n 3 n reaction are correct or not. Okay? So we will perform that. Uh, here you have some estimation on the different n 3 n reaction uh, as a function of energy with the threshold, and uh, we will perform that with the, the GAMS detector and the graphene detector, uh, again at the NFS facility. Okay, another, uh, another experiment we, we will try to, to do also. Remember, I see you when, uh, when I spoke about the measurement of neutron spectrum emitted in, in this kind of reaction, then we cannot distinguish an N prime, N to N, and free N reaction. So we will try to do it. How? Here you have neutron spectrum emitted in a reaction, emitted uh, in a neutron uh, induced reaction on lead, but we could have done uh, another, uh, another samples at 14 MeV. So and you recognize you have your uh, you, you have the component of uh, evaporation, you have the direct reaction, and you have the uh, neutron emitted during the pre-equilibrium. But as I mentioned, uh, we want to measure the spectrum of n to n and spectrum f to n reaction. So we will use a neutron beam, collimated neutron beam, a set of detectors here. By time of fly, we will measure the neutron energy, my direct time of fly. But in addition, we will use this detector to measure the x minus 1 other neutron emitted in the reaction. It means if I detect a neutron here, I measure its energy, and in coincidence, I have a neutron elsewhere, I say it's end to end reaction. If I detect by my detector, if I have two other neutrons, I say it's an end to end reaction because one neutron here and two neutrons here, it's end to end reactions. Okay? So we just have this, uh, the photography is not good, but uh, we have to just open a little bit our detector in order that neutrons can be uh, emitted from here and can be detected to, to here. So, uh, in fact, we already did this experiment at low energy at 13 MeV, and uh, it, it works quite well. We had a lot of correction to do, but it works, it works quite well. And at higher energy, namely 30 MeV, it will be more interesting because the pre more becomes more important, and also we can open new uh, channels like N3N and N4N. So, uh, I will finish by uh, summarize. Uh, what I, I uh, said to you, that uh, NXN reactions are important for different topics in reactor, in the estimation of waste production in high neutron flux, and also in order to have uh, accurate uh, data, uh, nuclear data. Many three techniques exist. Maybe I forgot others, but uh, I think it's the three main techniques uh, used to, to measure the cross section. And uh, just to be clear that all the techniques can, can not be used in all the cases uh, because you have some strong uh, limitation by, by each case. Thank you for your attention.